בשם השם נעשה ונצליח שיעור תורה. ברוך השם, we have some new people, we have פרשת קורח, which is a very famous פרשה, because some of the lessons you learn about in פרשת קורח are some of the most valuable lessons that can apply to every single generation. Now, uh, along the way, ask questions, obviously, that uh, makes the shiur even more interesting, and uh, the key is not just necessarily for me to speak, but also for me to answer questions. So if I don't know what you guys don't know, there's no way that I'll, you know, uh, always answer those questions. So feel free to ask. So, Parashat Korach, I mean, it's summarizing in, in generally the entire parasha in a, in a brief sentence, it's about a fight, about a huge, huge fight between two giants. Obviously, you know, one of them is Korach and his people, and the other one is Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, of course, you can't really compare the two, there's no one ever was or will be like Moshe Rabbeinu, according to what we've seen in the Torah, what Hashem himself has said, both in, the, uh, in his significance and also in his humility, which is one of the most amazing things that you see about a lot of the major sages that were really lovers of Hashem and people that Hashem himself said he loved them, whether it be Abraham Avinu or David HaMelech or uh, Moshe Rabbeinu and, and, and many others, you see that all of them have a common trait, which is humility. So, in essence, you see the biggest giants in history... Someone like Moshe Rabbeinu that was able to talk to God face to face, meaning like we're talking, not necessarily that he actually saw anything, uh, because God doesn't have a physical form per se, but uh, he was able to talk to him in a normal way, which is unlike anyone else, everyone else, even the other prophets throughout history, uh, their prophecy came to them either through a dream or through some type of meditation or even uh, some type of epilepsy. Uh, some type of process where they were all laying down or sitting down when they were speaking to Hashem and not awake, whereas Moshe Rabbeinu was awake, alert, and walking around as if, you know, like anything else. So this giant, Moshe Rabbeinu, who got the Torah from Hashem, gave it to Am Yisrael, was our leader, was our king, was just really just a, an extraordinary person, has... The most, is, it says specifically in the Torah that he's the most humble person that ever lived. Which should really take, give us a little bit, if you really think about this, make us reflect about ourselves and, and, and people around us and people around the world. The biggest person, the most accomplished person in history, he was rich, yes. He was smart, yes. He was strong physically, yes. He was spiritually the highest level, yes. He spoke to God, yes. Everything you could possibly ever want and even didn't know that you want, but you would want it when you found out what it is, he had all of it. But yet, he was more humble than anyone else that ever lived. So when you think about something like that, and then sometimes you see regular people that they're, uh, they, they can, you know, they're barely anyone, you know, they, but they think of themselves as something special. So you see how absurd the situation is and you see how far someone is from truth. The reason why Moshe Rabbeinu, sometimes the, the, uh, the midah of anava, the midah of humility uh, that Moshe Rabbeinu had is misunderstood where people think that he was, you know, some type of miskan where he was like, you know, afraid to talk to people or anything like that. No, Moshe Rabbeinu had a lot of confidence. He was a leader. In order to be a true leader, you have to have a lot of confidence. He was also very physically strong. I mean, he went to fight Og the giant and killed him. Uh, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu was also very, very big. He was 10 amma tall, which is between 15 and 20 feet tall. And his, uh, his uh, uh, stick was also 10 amma. And he was able to jump 10 amma in the air. So you're talking about, you know, very, you know, much bigger than, and, and more accomplished physically, spiritually, in every way than we have in our world today or any other time in history. So, and he was able to win wars. He was a fighter. He killed people if necessary. And yet, people think that he was like, oh, you know, maybe if you, if, you're, if you have humility, maybe that means you're like this miskan on the side that's afraid to talk, it's afraid to say anything, and that's not true. The humility that they're referring to with Moshe Rabbeinu is that in front of the crowd, in front of the people that, uh, uh, in front of the people that uh, were around, he obviously knew where he stood, meaning he knew he was the leader. Of course, he thought everyone else was also very good, 
But the, hum the true humility that he had was because he truly knew as much as it's possible for a human to know Hashem. So he knew who he's standing next to. And he knew how much of a nothing he is next to Hashem. And that's one of the things that every Jew needs to do throughout their life, and, and really on a, on a daily basis, is to truly understand that there's nothing, there's never really a reason in life to be proud of. There's never a really a reason to be too, you know, to have pride for anything, because if you're physically fit, God gave it to you. What are you proud for? If you're rich, God gave it to you. What are you proud about? You know, if, if anything that you have was given to you, you didn't do anything. So there's really nothing for you to be proud about. And it's very, very important for someone to try to connect to Hashem in a, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a very uh, passionate way because when you connect to Hashem, it becomes easier to be humble because then you realize who you're standing next to. Now, why be humble? Because aside from the fact that a prideful person is someone that the people around them can't stand. The, you know, people that are, you know, whether it's friends or even his own family, do, the Gemara says it itself, people cannot, don't like him. They hate him. Uh, no one likes a prideful person. Unless it's himself, which even himself, he probably hates himself, because especially, to be proud usually is a... Especially Hashem. Hashem, actually, it says Hashem hates him. Yeah. Hashem, it actually says about Hashem, Hashem says he cannot be in his life. Because it cannot be, because he if he's proud, that means he, that means he thinks he's God. And Hashem says, he's not God, I'm God. So there can't be two gods in, in one place. So I can't be in his life. So being proud is a very, very dangerous midah. It's a very, very dangerous characteristic to have because it's a, uh, in, in um, uh, Proverbs it says this, the, the pride is what happens before the fall. You know, usually before someone falls, usually before they have this earthquake in their life, it's before that they were very, very proud of who they were. Uh, and, uh, and the key is that when we're proud, and you know, we're pretty much telling Hashem that we don't need Him, and that uh, everything is in our power, everything that we're doing is in our hands. And that's obviously a uh, huge heresy, huge amount of uh, kfirah against Hashem, and it's not a good idea. So now this whole parasha is about two people. Well, I mean, in essence, obviously, obviously people, other people aren't involved, but it's about a fight between two people, two leaders. You have Korach and you have Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is the leader that Hashem chose to lead Israel. And Korach was also part of the Levi tribe. He was actually his cousin. And... Korach is also the, uh, Chazal explains to us that Korach actually was not only a very rich man, very smart man, but he also had Ruach HaKodesh. He was also a righteous man. He had Ruach HaKodesh. To, be, to have Ruach HaKodesh, you can't uh, be a Rasha. To have Ruach HaKodesh, that means you, you know, you're, you're above a regular one, normal person. one of the people carrying the Aron HaKodesh. Yeah. So... To have Ruach HaKodesh, you have to be a tzaddik. You can't be just a rasha from the beginning. So the question is, how did it happen? How could it be that someone went from being so righteous to having Ruach HaKodesh all the way to making a giant sin where towards the middle of the parasha, Hashem makes a special miracle where the ground swallows him. And Chazal explains to us is that until this day, there's a place in the desert where Korach and his 250 followers are still screaming, God is the truth, His Torah is the truth, and Moshe, his leader, is the truth. So until this day, he's suffering for what he did. So how could it be? You go from one, you know, this is from one end of the, to the other. It's, it's a, listen, someone did something bad, something good, and then he went down a little bit. Usually they don't become a complete rasha. You know, usually it's okay, so you're not a big tzaddik anymore. You're a regular person now. But to go from this end to that end, obviously something significant had to happen. And the, uh, the root of the cause, in one word, is pride. Kavod. The details is what we're going to go over this, uh, on this parasha. So now at the beginning of the parasha, it says, Vayikach Korach ben Yitzar ben Keat Ben Levi, Vedatan Aviram, Daviram, Bnei Elihav, 
Ve'on ben Peled ben Eoven. So it says, uh, Koach, the son of, uh, of um, Ital, the son of Kohat, the son of Levi, he's from the Levi tribe, like I said, separated himself, meaning that he separated himself from the rest of Am Yisrael. He thought that, you know, they, 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 you know, they're trying to make a mutiny, pretty much. They're going against Moshe right now. So he's trying to gather some people to get together with them. And then it mentions that he was also with, with Datan and, Avi, uh, and, Avi, um, and Aviram. If you guys remember, Datan and Aviram are... The troublemakers we've heard about several times. They're the ones that uh, ratted on Moshe to Paro when, uh, when he killed the Egyptian. They're the ones that stayed behind and didn't uh, go with Amisra when we left Egypt. They stayed behind. And then they went to Paro and they told him, Listen, you made a mistake letting go of all of these slaves. So they went with Paro after Israel. And then after... The Egyptians went through the sea. They stayed behind to see what happens. Yes. They saw all the Egyptians die. They said, oh, wow, so this, this God is really truth. And Hashem actually reopened, so we split the sea just for them. Because they did sort of a tshuva. Which is amazing how Hashem gave them that much. And we'll go over in a second of why he gave them so much benefit of the doubt. Why they have so much schut. And they continued sinning. Every time there was a problem, they were always involved. Whether it's the Egel, or it's the, uh, you know, the Egyptians. And now with Korach, they're his partners. They're going with Korach against Moshe Rabbeinu. So the question is, why, is, why are these people even still alive? Why didn't Hashem kill them 80 different times that he had an opportunity to? Why didn't he kill them already? So the story of Datan Naviram is that they were the cops in Egypt. In Egypt, one of the things that the Egyptians did is that they uh, made some of the Jews, the cops against the Jews. <laughs> Meaning that they say that they, we're going to make you leaders and you're going to report to us if they're not uh, building fast enough, not, not doing their job. And you're going to have to beat them up. You know, you tell us, and uh, if, you, if you, tell us, you, know, you tell us the truth, and if, you, know, you have to beat them up. If you don't beat them up, then you at least have to tell us and then we'll beat them up. So the Tan Aviram and all the cops actually that happened in Egypt didn't tell the Egyptians. They didn't want to beat up the, their, their brothers and sisters. So all of the cops, the Jewish cops that were in uh, Egypt, got the schut of surviving even though they weren't exactly righteous. So this kind of shows you or shows you clearly how one tiny deed, one tiny mitzvah that someone does, which logically, I mean, it's something they should do. I mean, why would you want your family and friends to get beat up by the Egyptians? But even one right deed that you're doing to help your brothers and sisters of Am Yisrael buys you all the food in the world with, uh, you know, with Hashem. So these Rashaim, these people, these evil people that have been going against Moshe Rabbeinu for so many years, able to see all of the miracles, able to go through uh, the whole process of getting the Torah and everything else, and all the way to here, all the way to this parasha. On the other end, this also teaches you another lesson. That it says that a rasha doesn't do tshuva even at the gate of hell. Even when, they're, when they're, if someone's a true rasha, when someone's a true evil person, and truly going against Hashem, even when you, Hashem, okay, punishes them, they're already at the gate of hell. They're about to go into Gehenom. They still don't do tshuva. Because these people, how do we learn it from them? In the beginning, when they didn't know God, okay, let's say, fine. But after they saw all the miracles Hashem did in Egypt, all the miracles He did with the ocean, all the miracles He did in Al Sinai, eventually it's okay, Hashem is the truth. Well, I'm going to go and follow what Hashem does. Instead of doing that, they go against His leader, they go against Hashem Himself. So it shows you that miracles do not make people religious. That's also part of the reason why Hashem does not do any open miracles uh, like that, to that extent anymore, because it just does not make people religious. It may make someone uh, reflect, but to keep someone religious, it does not. Someone, let's say, for example, if someone had a near-death experience, you know, or they, uh, you know, let's say they uh, got saved from something, or something great happened in their life, some type of miracle happened in their life, it may make them reflect it may make them want to keep a few mitzvot here and there, but that's generally short term. That's not long term. Short term, maybe they'll keep Shabbat for three weeks. Maybe they'll keep it even for a year. But in order to stay religious, 
The only way to do it is with Torah. The only way to do it is with regular study of Torah, whether it's five minutes or five hours per day. It has to be every day because that's the only thing that we have as a connection to Hashem on a daily basis. It has to be Torah. So if someone has to learn some type of Torah every day, and I said, like I always tell you guys, I started with 15 minutes a day. That's when I first started learning Torah. I started with 15 minutes a day. To me, that was the whole world. Oh, Hashem, we do a lot more now. But the key is that you have to have a daily connection with Hashem. So when my cousin told me about learning Torah, you know, we'll start with 15 minutes. I said, okay, you know what? I don't, you know, 15 minutes a day is a little tough. Why don't I just study for four or five hours one day a week? It's the same amount of time, maybe even more time. She says, no, no, 15 minutes a day, even if it's less time, it's better. Because that's a daily connection with Hashem instead of once a week. How do you compare it? So saying to somebody, listen, don't eat every day, just eat once a week. But eat for five hours. You won't survive a week. You understand? It's the same concept with Hashem. Hashem says, if it had to be, let them leave me, but not my Torah. And if they, if they, leave, if they leave me for one day, I leave them for two days. Meaning if you're someone that has a connection, a daily connection with Hashem, but stops learning Torah, that spiritual connection, that, which, which you feel when you learn Torah every day, you actually feel this, that amazing feeling, that amazing connection with Hashem, if you don't learn for just, you're learning obviously every day for, for a while, and then you stop learning even for one day, you have this yeah. emptiness, emptiness that at the minimum lasts for two days, sometimes lasts for much longer. So the... The connection with Hashem, when you learn Torah, is so extraordinary that it, uh, it's actually painful to not have it, once you have it. That's, that's, that's how amazing it is. So now, going back to Korach, his people, the Tan and Aviram, these people are with Korach. And then they also mention another person by the name of On, the son of Pelet. He is one of the uh, seeds of, uh, of uh, Reuven, the Reuven tribe. Now, the first thing we're going to learn is that, if you notice, On son of the son of Pelet is only mentioned here in the beginning, but he's not mentioned later on. When you continue the story and they mention the names, they no longer mention On. He's only mentioned once. Why is he only mentioned once? Because here he was with Koach. Here he was part of the tribe. He was, you know, making the whole... Uh, you know, a um, team and, uh, you know, pretty much the, the whole uh, fight against Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron. But then, he had something amazing happen. His wife saved him. Chazal tells us that a woman builds and a woman destroys. Isha bona, isha oreset. That's true. So, the first question is, how could it be that a woman builds and destroys at the same time? The answer is that it's not the same woman. It's two different women. One woman builds her man and the house, and one woman destroys her man and the house. So the woman that builds is the woman that encourages her husband to connect to Hashem, to pray every day, to learn Torah, to be focused with what he needs to do in life, whether it's work, raising the kids, and just, you know, gives him good direction and support to do it. Good support to do what's needed to be done in this world. Not to just purely be focused on money, not to be just purely focused on, on, on things that are miscellaneous like basketball or whether it be friends or cards or any of that nonsense, but really trying to you know, connect the family as a whole with God. A woman is responsible for raising the family. She has a much bigger responsibility of raising the family than the husband does. Unless the husband is a Talmud Chacham, he's bringing the Torah, the woman is actually responsible of teaching the children the Torah. So she needs to know Halachot also. It's not like just a man needs to learn Torah. The woman also needs to know Torah. She needs to know at least enough of all of the Halachot, the, 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 the Chumash. She needs to know a lot of Torah. Basically, she needs to know as much Torah as most people in the world. Because she needs to raise the kids with Torah in their life. If the woman knows nothing and has zero connection with God, but she does. She does the worries for The husband says, listen, we're going to keep Shabbat, so make sure that the food, don't cook it on uh, Shabbat, just put it on a plata. And uh, by the way, uh, you know, on uh, Yom Kippur, we don't eat, so she doesn't eat. Or, uh, and, uh, you know, and, uh, when we um, have the Chagim, don't turn on the light. And if she's just doing things as a, like a robot, without an actual connection with Hashem, then, unfortunately, what ends up happening is that it's a silent poison within the household 
that's being created that people don't realize because what ends up happening is that the kids, the husband is doing his thing. He's learning to lie every day. It doesn't affect the husband all the time. Sometimes it does, but not all the time. But the children, who are they trying to replicate? They're trying to replicate the, the, the parents. So when the kid, whether it's a boy or a girl, sees the father, he's learning Torah, wow, this is great, nice. But the Ima is, uh, is, is watching TV. She's watching uh, Oprah Winfrey on something on, on television all day and eating bonbons. You know, then the kid at some point or another is going to uh, have to make a choice. And unfortunately, the Yetzirah is very, very strong. And it could potentially make that choice of going in that direction. So having, doing tshuva and, and, and having a Jewish household requires both the husband and the wife. The key in why they say that the wo woman builds is because every successful man throughout history had to have a supporting woman. Very, very rarely do you ever see a very tr a truly successful person in anything whether it's to spirituality or, or in, in monetary ways. Very rarely do you see a successful man without having a success, you know, someone that's supporting him, whether it be a president or be a sage. So the woman that's trying to build a Jewish household has to encourage her husband to really continue going with Deir Hashem, continue going with Hashem's way. So who's the other woman? Isha Oleh said, the woman destroys... The Shaolet said is what called so this oh so first off, this is the woman that On had. On had a very good woman, a very righteous woman. And he came to her and he said, Listen, Moshe Rabenu is uh, you know, Koach told us that Moshe Rabenu is not good for us. He's uh, you know, he's he's too proud, which is the opposite of reality. He is uh, you know, he's really not uh, looking for our best interest. He's only looking out for his own family, you know, the, the priesthood, the, the Kohen Agadol job he gave to his brother instead of giving it to me. I should get it. Or, uh, no, Koach should get it. Um, and, uh, you know, he started saying a lot of bad things about, uh, about Moshe. And so she tells him, listen, what, what's the difference for you if Moshe Rabbeinu is the leader or Koach is the leader? You still stay the same regular guy. You still stay you. You don't change. You don't become a leader or something. You don't become a new... You don't have any... Nothing changes in your life. So why bother being involved in this fight at all? And he says, yeah, but I, I made, I made a uh, swear to them that I'm going to join them. I promised them that I'm going to join them. She goes, don't worry. I'll take care of it. So what did she do? She gave him some alcohol to drink and he went to sleep. But now his friends are coming to, to, to pick him up to, uh, you know, to go against Moshe. Public scene, whole big protest. So this tzaddika, what did she do? She stood in the, uh, she took off her kisui rosh, and she stood in the front door, like this, uh, blocking the door. But she she uncovered her hair. Why did she uncover her hair? Because in those days, everyone covered their hair. That's that's the modesty for a woman. It's a, it's, a, it's an obligation in Judaism for a woman to cover her hair. And these people that were part of the 250 rabbis that were part of Korah's team, they're all righteous people. They weren't Rashaim. At least not yet. So for them to, uh, to see a woman with uncovered hair was un impossible. There's no way. So as soon as they saw that there's a woman in front of On's house that's not covering her hair, she immediately ran away. They said, okay, we have to skip this house. The, uh, so as soon as they saw... As soon as they saw that there's a woman with uncovered hair, they immediately ran away and they just skipped his house. So what she did saved his life. Now the uh, the Isha Olesit, the woman that destroys, that's Kolach's wife. How do we know it's Kolach's wife? Because this is the reason of why all of this happened. Koach was righteous. He was rich. He had Wohakodesh. He had everything he wanted. So now when they had the whole ceremony of making everyone, everyone a, uh, you know, it was a levy. So the levies got a special job. There's the Kohanim, there's the levies, and there's Israel. So they got a special ceremony to become levies. And they were anointed with the oil, with the special oil, to become levies. And when they did through that process... They had to shave their entire, uh, their, their body. And there's no hair on their body, so they had to shave their face and their head. And they put the oil on them. And it's a whole beautiful ceremony they did. 
And then later on, obviously, they grow their beards and hair and so on. But when he came home, all bald, his wife says to him, what is this? What did they do to you? What is this Moshe Rabbeinu making fun of you? Oh, I guess he was jealous of your beard because you had such a nice beard. Now, you know, you look like a woman. Where's your manhood? How come you don't stand up for yourself? Why does Moshe have all the, uh, you know, all of the uh, righteous, uh, the, the position, the big position, all the kavod? You should have it. Wait, you're not a man? You're not standing up for it? <laughs> So this is a Isha Oreset. This is a Isha that is looking for Kavod instead of looking for what Hashem wants. So she fired him up and he went with it. And this led to his, her death and a bunch of other people's death. A Isha Oreset is someone that's worrying about the wrong things. Meaning that instead of telling her husband, Honey, you should learn Torah. Honey, you should uh, go to Shiur Torah. Honey, you should go to pray in the morning, in the afternoon, and do all of those things. Honey, what? How come you're always with your friends praying? Why don't you spend time with me and watch movies? <laughs> or go to the mall with me? Or hang out with the kids? How come you're always away and praying with your friends? What, you don't want to be with me? This is what happens in life every day. This is what happens everyday life. No one should feel, oh, this is me or something. This is everyday life. The reason why this is happening so often in so many houses is because there is too much separation between couples today. Couples today are living two separate lives even when they're living in the same house. Vacation, they take separately. She goes with her friends, he goes with his friends. All the fun things, they do separately. All the problems, it's his fault, it's her fault. Okay, so we deal with it together. So all the stuff that's not fun, they do together. All the stuff that's fun, they do separately. They have two separate lives. So the wife is thinking, oh, he's learning Torah with his friends. Well, well he's, he's, he's hanging out. This is the equivalent of going to the bar for her. It's the same thing. He's going to shoot Torah at 9 o'clock at night. Well, what is it? What is it? I'm not good enough for him. He can't hang out with me. Like she thinks that he's going to hang out. On the other hand, when she wants some personal time, she wants some quality time from her husband, the husband is like, nah, I'm tired now, let me watch some basketball. I want to watch some TV, leave me alone. Or if you want, you want to hang out with me, but just sit on the couch and be quiet so I can watch my basketball game. So there's such a huge gap between husband and wife together that it's not surprising that over 80% of couples today in America get divorced. Over 80%, which means that every 10 couples, 8 of them will not make it. And we're not talking about not make it after 20 years. We're talking about not make it in a very quick period of time. I mean, I think they, uh, within a couple of years or less, and I mean, we've had even records. I think one of the celebrities a few years ago divorced the next day. Why are they divorcing so many times? Because it's become normal. Oh, it's no big deal. Divorce, get married, divorce, get married. Ah, it's like boyfriend, girlfriend. It's not a big deal. Today I have one wife, tomorrow I have another one. Today I have one husband, tomorrow I have three. People are so far from Deir Hashem, they're so far away from the ways of Hashem and what the Torah says that it creates problems within the household. There's a huge gap between them. A woman that destroys is a woman that's trying to get her husband to spend time with her doing miscellaneous things instead of doing things that are going to build the family. It's very important in order to solve this problem, in order to have a successful marriage, because we can talk about the problems in today's marriage for the next five hours and still not be finished with part one. So we already know the problems. Everyone knows the problems that are in the world. We see it, we hear about it. There's no questions asked. The way to solve the problem is when someone is, when a man decides, or a woman decides to live with Hashem as part of the life, part of her life or part of his life, they start learning Torah, they start praying, they start doing the things that Hashem is requiring for us to do it. The key is to involve the entire family. It is impossible to do a true tshuva by yourself and succeed. You could try, but unfortunately what would end up happening is that either, let's say the man loves God, and he starts learning Torah, but his wife, no interest. And he doesn't, you know, 
have patience with her to teach her, and tries and tries and tries little by little. He's like, okay, whatever. She can do whatever she wants, and I'll do whatever I want. And, you know, eventually I'll go together. And then she'll go together. No, fine. I don't have to, uh, I don't have to worry about her. She can do whatever I want. She's a grown-up. That's the wrong thought. Why? Because what ends up happening is that either it leads to divorce, because there's such a big gap after a while, he's a tzaddik, she's a rasha, or she's a tzaddika, and he's a rasha, they no, they no longer have anything in common. They're two different people now. He's going to Beknesset, she's going to a pub. She's going to, uh, she's reading Tehilim, he's, uh, I don't know, Hashem Echem, what he's, what, what he's reading. You know, he's uh, watching uh, nonsense, or, or, you know, all types of things that are in the world. It happens a lot, like you said. So that's the key. So it has to be together. It's like Ish Isha, without Hashem in the middle, it's Aish. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Like a little... It has to be a family thing. And also sometimes, so somebody says, listen, I'm learning Torah all the time, and she's, uh, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going much faster than her, and I want to do this, and I want to do that, I want to do a lot more on myself, and she's not ready for it. What should I do? So the natural logic that we have would say, okay, slow down, don't, you know, the natural thing we would think is, uh, no, just go, keep doing. Be a machmir, or tell her, force her to do it. No, it's not the right thing. You have to slow down, and go at the same level. And little by little, bring her up with you. Don't leave her behind. You can't be, you know, wearing uh, black and white, going to Netz Minyan, learning to five hours a day, and uh, a machmir in pretty much every single mitzvah, and your wife is still walking around with tank tops and no kisu rosh and uh, a mini skirt. Two can't work. Two can't work. You have to go up together, little by little, little by little, you go up together, and the beauty of it is that when you learn Torah together, which is the best thing you could do for a marriage, is to learn Torah together, by the way, because it's unlike physical, which eventually loses its, its a, uh, significance over time. It's always good, but again, it's <coughs> not the same. You know, things change. People change. You get older. You're 70 years old. It's not the same thing as when you were 20 years old. This is just a natural thing that happens. The physical, a woman and a man are not going to look the same in 20 years from now. They're not, you're not going to feel the same way to the physical. But spiritual connection can only improve. So when you have Torah lessons together, you're learning Torah, even if it's only a half hour a day, even if it's during dinner, you have dinner, instead of watching TV, you watch Shil Torah. Instead of, uh, you know, uh, talking about basketball and, uh, I don't know, what uh, uh, her or your friends are doing this weekend, you uh, talk about, uh, you know, some type of Divrei Torah. When you do that, you're connecting with each other in a spiritual way. And the connection that you develop becomes second to none, becomes something extraordinary, becomes something that's irreplaceable. And you have yourself a chavuta that truly understands you. And that's something that I can tell you from experience is something unbelievable. It's better than anything else you could ever imagine. The marriage improves, and believe it or not, even the physical improves. So everything improves through it. When you have no spiritual connection, when there is no Torah together, then unfortunately you're, you're betting on the fact that she's going to go up on her own just like you're going up on your own. And that's a very, very big risk because what happens is that usually one person goes faster than the other and it ends up, uh, you know, it ends up uh, creating some problems. So now, while Koach's wife is telling him to go against Moshe and be a man, On's wife saves his life. So that's, that's one of the things. So now when they first go to Moshe Rabbeinu, they tell him, listen, you have the position with Hashem, you have your brother, you gave him the job. Who says Hashem even wants you? Not just who, who says Hashem, you know, wants you to have this position, but who even says that Hashem wants you as part of Israel? So Moshe has very much a lot of patience. So initially it says that Moshe heard and he fell on his face. He didn't immediately respond to them and started telling them Lasha and punch him in the face. He didn't do that stuff. He was embarrassed that this is even happening. How could this possibly happen? We just had the Meraglim, the whole issue with the spies last week. Hashem killed all of them. We had the Ege, the, the, the whole uh, the, the idol worship in Mount Sinai not too long ago. A bunch of people died then. This happened again. How could it be? Am I, am, he's looking at himself. Is, is something wrong with me? 
So he's giving them the benefit of the doubt to see what's going on. He's trying to talk to, to him. He's trying, it says that Moshe spoke to Koach and his entire assembly. He's not telling, he's not yelling at them right away. He's trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. But then Koach starts doing something that is just unbearable for Moshe Rabbeinu. When Koach is making fun of Moshe, Moshe doesn't care. He's like, me, I'm like the ground, just step on me. No problem, make fun of me, tell me I'm this, tell me I'm that, no problem. Me, I'm nothing, you're right. I don't know anything, uh, Hashem is everything. But then Koach starts going against the Torah. And there's a few examples in the Midrash of what he did. So first he tells all of Am Yisrael, and he tells them that this is, the, I'm going to picture you guys, Moshe and his family, this is what they do. There's an old lady, that a husband died, an old widow, a husband died, and all she has is a, uh, a small lot of land with some grass on it, with some you know, grass on it, and she grows the, the fruits to, to eat. Moshe and Aaron, they go over there, oh, you have to give maser to the Kohanim. So she gives them a maser. She barely has any food to eat, they're already taking a maser. And then the levy comes, Aaron comes back and he tells, okay, you have to give money to the levy. So they take another 10%. And then they tell her to take a part of the fruits and this and that. And they're constantly on top of her. Of course, you can't. You have to have Shemitah and you can't do this. You can't do that. So the woman says, okay, you know what? This is too much problems for me. Let me just sell my land, my small lot of land. And I'll buy two uh, sheep. So she buys two sheep. And what happens? Aaron comes again. He says, oh, the sheep... You're going to take off their uh, fur? You have to give Maser. Oh, they had a uh, newborn? You have to, for a newborn goes to the Kohanim. So she goes, okay, okay, fine, fine, fine. Okay, you know what? Let me just kill these, you know, let me butcher these sheep and eat it. At least I'll have meat. I barely have any, I'm giving everything to this Moshe and Aaron. He's picturing, he's, he's, he's painting this terrible picture of Moshe. It's a complete lie. And we'll go over why it's a lie in a second. The whole story doesn't exist. He's making up this whole story of how Moshe and Aaron and his family are taking advantage of this poor widow and taking everything she has while she has nothing to eat and they're dancing and uh, enjoying the wealth. She goes, okay, listen, let me at least, uh, you know, eat the meat. So, she wants to eat the meat and says, okay, you have to still give a piece. The uh, certain sections of the uh, of the uh, sheep have to go to Kohanim. Koban. That's, that's all. <laughs> She's okay, you know what? Everything I have, I'm giving it to God. I don't want to deal with business anymore. Everything I have, I'm going to give it to God. So what happens? So Aaron comes again. He goes, oh, everything you have to come to God. Oh, he says in this parasha, everything that, everything that uh, is given to God is given to the Kohanim. Well, God's not going to eat it. Obviously, he gives it to the Kohanim. She goes, you see, they're taking all of our money. Now, this is the first story. It's a complete lie. Because first of all, they're in the desert. There is no such thing as grass. There is no weeds. There is no fruits. So the story doesn't exist. Second of all, as far as the sheep, Am Yisrael left Egypt very, very wealthy. No one was poor. There was no such thing as a poor widow. Everyone had a lot of sheep and a lot of everything. So there is no such thing as a, some poor widow woman. And the third thing is, which is the most logical one, is as we talked about in past weeks, Maaseh is off of profits. So if the woman is so poor and barely has anything to eat, where is the Maaseh coming from? She has to cover her expenses and eat first. Mm -hmm. She can't give the Maaseh before she eats. She has to have at least, you know, she has to have, obviously she has to be break even. If someone is making enough money, let's say from selling the fruits or selling the sheep or anything like that, and they have, let's say, you know, $5,000 in expenses and $5,000 in income, there is no maser. It's break even. If there's $10,000 in income and $5,000 in expenses, as a $5,000 profit, then there's a maser. Same thing today. Someone makes a uh, money, they have to give 10% of net profit, net income. Okay, so this whole story is a complete illusion. So the next story, but this touched Am Yisrael's heart. And when you want to influence people, what do you do? You touch their emotions. You touch their emotions. If you touch their emotions, you're going to influence them. With the brain, not always. 
If we start talking about things that are logical, not everyone is going to agree that, yeah, this makes sense, this doesn't make sense, not so sure I want to take it on. But if I start telling you something very, very emotional, very personal, and things like that, it influences people like you wouldn't believe it. I'm not sure if this is a true story, so don't hold me to it, but I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if it is true. Someone said that during the first election that Obama ran uh, for president, there was a uh, man that passed out in the crowd during when he was doing the whole uh, running the whole campaign. He was giving a speech, and some man passed out from uh, you know in the crowd. And Obama got off of the stage, gave him a bottle of water, and you know, so everybody says, "Oh wow, he cares so much," you know, and it got everyone's emotions riled up. And that's actually what you see a lot of a lot of people that voted for him the first time. Uh, were disappointed, but still voted for him the second time. And you ask those people, why did you vote for him? And they start telling you, oh, I voted because he promised this, this, and this. He promised ABC. And you're like, no, no, he actually didn't. The other guy promised ABC. Oh, no, he didn't promise that? I thought he did. No, no. Oh, well, he's such a good speaker. And that's what happens. People pick them because he's a good speaker, not because he did anything good. Because he touched people's emotions. And that's generally how, you know, a lot of things work out in life. So, Korach used this tool 3,300 years before Obama did. He touched people's emotions by telling them a fake story that even by the time they found that it's fake, it's still there, like, already looking at Moshe and Aaron as, as evil people. It's already, it's hard to change your emotions. The second thing that he said, is like, listen, I think you're making, he tells Moshe, I think you're making up some of these rules. I don't think Hashem told you all these rules. I wasn't up there in the mountain with you. I don't think he told you all this. Moshe says, what do you mean? But you heard Hashem speak. These are the first, first two commandments. Not only did you hear Hashem speak, but after every time he said a commandment, everyone died. All of Am Yisrael died. And Hashem brought them back to life. And in the second commandment, they died again. And when Hashem started talking and saying the third commandment, they said to Moshe, no, 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 no. Please, go talk to him by yourself because if he continues talking, we're going to die. Our souls will leave us because the souls already left us before. So this is actually the first resurrection of the dead if, uh, you know, people that have a hard time believing of Hashem bringing back people from the dead. He's already done it in the Torah several times. So anyway, Korach starts making up the story. He's like, ah, I'm not sure if, you, if he says all of these things. This is mitzvah we heard about last week. But this tzitzit. And you say on this tzitzit, you have to have a string, of uh, a blue string. But what if the entire tzitzit, what if the entire talit is blue? Do I still need to have a blue string? Why? The whole thing is blue. So why would a blue tzitzit need to have a blue string? I already have a lot of blue. I have more blue than what your tzitzit has. You only have one string. I have the whole tzitzit. Tzitzit is blue. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, although that's your logic, and it may make logical sense, Hashem didn't talk about a blue tzitzit. He talked about a tzitzit with a blue string. We don't know if it's blue, by the way. It's tchelet. Tchelet is supposed to be something between the color of the sky and the night or in the morning. Uh, you know, and it's, It could be anything from uh, light blue to dark green. We call it blue because, I don't know, it's just a common thing that people think it is. That's why you see sometimes people that have a blue string on their tzitzit, but we're not sure it's, uh, it's blue. It comes from a, uh, a, a certain animal called uh, a chilazon. A snail. Uh, snail. Some people think it's a snail, some people think it's an octopus. It doesn't exist anymore. Snail, snail, it's chilazon. Can, but we're not sure chilazon means snail in the oh, Svata okay. Kodesh. Okay. We're not sure Chilazon means snail in, in Svat Kodesh. Either way, it does not exist anymore right now. Some people have said that they've rediscovered it. There was a very big rabbi in 1885. Uh, his name ran away from me right now, but in 1885, he uh, wrote a whole big book proving that he found the, uh, the Chilazon, and he made a bunch of uh, tzitziot with this color on it. But we're not sure it's right. So there was a debate... And until this day, for the last 120 years already, there's a debate of whether it is or it isn't. Some people believe it is the right one, some people don't believe. The point is that the, uh, we won't know it for sure until the Mashiach comes. 
But as far as the mitzvah of tzitzit, to show anybody, for everyone knows, even though the, the, the verse in last week's Torah says <coughs> it has to have a, 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 a string of, uh, of blue, it does, it's not an obligation to have the ptil uh, the, uh, the blue. Even if it's all white, like we all have, most of us have just a white, that's still fulfilling the mitzvah. The mitzvah is the tzitzit. The ptil tchelet is if it's possible. But if you're unsure, meaning which we're all unsure, even the ones that wear it are unsure if it's truly the right color, then obviously you're fulfilling everything that you can. So now, Korach is using his logic, which a lot of people do today, to say, no, listen, I'm, I'm going to wear a tzitzit that's all blue, but no blue string. Moshe Rabbeinu says, no, okay, that's your logic, but that's against Torah. That's kfirah, no, Hashem says... Have a blue string. He said nothing about a, a blue tzitzit. This is really an analogy. This is not just talking about tzitzit. Koch doesn't really care about the tzitzit. This is an analogy of comparing Moshe is the ptid chelet, is the string, and Am Yisrael is the talit. So he says, we don't need the, the, uh, the, the blue string. We don't need Moshe. Because we're already all blue. We're already all tzaddikim. And then the next example, as he says, this is actually a very interesting question. And I'll ask you guys what you think. He says, if I have a house full of sifret Torah, mm -hmm. the scrolls, the scrolls, not just the uh, chumash, the scrolls themselves, the ones that you have in the Knesset, you know, you, sifret Torah, most important thing, <clears throat> the house is full of them. Do I still need to put a mezuzah on the wall? Do I still need to put a mezuzah on the door? Yes, of course. Yes, yes of course. But I have Sefer Torah. What's the mezuzah going to have that the Sefer Torah doesn't have? have I'm going to fight for both sides, by the way. So, because I want to see what you guys to, think. To protect, to protect the entrance. Yes, but but the Sefer Torah, the verses that are written yeah, on on be. the mezuzah, it's only a couple of verses. On the Sefer Torah, it's the entire Torah. You can put and the you Sefer have... Torah on the... On the <laughs> no, no, but seriously. You can not, because you have to put the mezuzah on the, the doorpost. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's the halakha. Yeah. Okay, but you have a Sefer Torah, it has the whole... There's a lot more than a mezuzah. Yeah. Mezuzah yeah. only has but but a few Torah verses. Because it's written with the... Uh, but the whole... Okay, but the Sefer Torah yeah, is also... Yeah, but you can't the put the Sefer Torah on the wall, on the door. Okay, but the whole house is full of Sefer... Imagine this house over here. Full of sifret to offer. It's still a house, it still has an entrance. And it says in the sifret, What do you think? What do you think, Tom? What do you think, Tom? The whole house is full of sifret to Yeah, but it's not the mitzvah. You have two paragraphs on a mezuzah. And then you have, let's say, you have 500 sifret Torah, which have 300,000 letters. Make a separate yeah, Torah. Yeah, the Mezuzah is closed. It's no, that's it's open. It's, it's, it's open. open. It's open. But, uh, it's from God. He tells you really clear. Put it in the Shah Recha. What do you think, Tomo? Okay, so you all said they came because you all know the right answer. So I'm trying to see. Battle, battle both sides. That's how it gets your mind thinking. To battle for both sides. So now... Um, Koach says, it doesn't make any sense to me. Because the whole house is full of Shifre Torah. I have 500 Shifre Torah. What do you have? This little mezuzah with two verses on with two paragraphs on it? Who needs this thing? I have Shifre Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu says exactly what you guys said. Moshe Rabbeinu says, Hashem said, put the mezuzah on the wall and the doorpost. We don't ask why. It doesn't need to make sense to us. And that's what Jews need to understand today. The mitzvah that Hashem commanded us to do, whether it's to do tzitzit, or mezuzah, or kosher, or uh, tefillin, or uh, nida, or uh, anything, anything, Shabbat, anything, it doesn't matter if it makes sense to you. It does not matter if it agrees with your brain. It does not matter if you understand or not. Because again, remember, if we understood God, we would be God. If you understood how God thinks all the time, and you understood everything He does, the way He does it, you would be God. That's a simple. That's 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 what uh, I think it was Rambam or Ramban said it. 
He says, if I understood God, I would be God. So the fact that you don't understand why we have to eat a certain diet, or why a woman needs to be modest, or why you need to keep Shabbat and you can't drive, even though it makes sense, technically, logically, to drive to shul, you're going to pray. It makes sense that you should use a car because you can go to the best synagogue. It doesn't matter it makes sense. Hashem said no. It doesn't matter that it doesn't make sense that someone that's a Michalel Shabbat has eternal suffering if he doesn't do tshuva. Eternal suffering. Eternal. Forever. There's three sins. Three sins that if a person does not do tshuva, the suffering is forever. There's no tshuva after that. There's, uh, meaning the, the, uh, the genom is forever. One of them is Michalel Shabbat. second one is Zerah Levatala. What's Zerah Levatala? is wasting seed. Yeah. And the third one is Chilul Hashem. So Chilul Hashem, you can understand. Okay, Chilul Hashem, I'm going against Hashem. I'm doing things against Hashem publicly. Okay, I understand that. Hashem is going against me. I went against him my whole life. I understand. Zera Levatala, the wasting seed. Almost understand. Okay, when you really think about it, every, 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 uh, every time that uh, the, uh, the um, sperms come out of the man's body, they did a research, it's the equivalent of 300 million seeds. Which means, it's technically 300 million people that a man is murdering. By wasting it. No, no, no. If it's, if it's on purpose, then the, uh, the, then the person gets the eternal suffering. If it's not on purpose, but you still need to make tshuva about of course you have to make tshuva. It's still a sin, but it's not eternal yeah. suffering. So a person is killing 300 million people a day, let's say. So how do you do tshuva? Like murdering 300 million people a day. I understand that. But Shabbat, I don't understand. Let's say I, don't, I obviously go because you learn. But I'm saying, let's say I don't understand. Let's say I'm a, I'm a Alex, no nothing. And I don't understand. What do you mean? Okay, so I drive on Shabbat. I have to get eternal suffering? I don't understand that. Okay, I drove on Shabbat. I, I didn't work. Hashem said, don't work. I didn't work. So why do I have to get this stuff? And why is that the same thing as going against uh, saying that Hashem is uh, something bad? Why is it the same thing? This is actually one of the things we learned from last week that Hashem he puts Chilul Shabbat and Abodah Zarah, which is idol worship, same level. First three commandments out of the Ten Commandments is between us and God about idol worship. Don't use His name in vain. He's the only God. Fourth commandment, Shabbat, which means it's in the same level. It's before murder, meaning, we've talked about this before, but since there's some new people here, Chilul Shabbat is drastically worse, not just a little bit worse, drastically worse than murder. Meaning, that if the murderer kills people on a weekly basis, five days a week he kills people, but he keeps Shabbat, the other guy doesn't kill anyone, but he's a Mechalel Shabbat. Mechalel Shabbat gets much worse punishment. Doesn't make logical sense, guys. Does not make logical sense. But this goes back to the point, and we're going to move on to the next subject. It does not need to make sense. Because this is what God said. The reason why we do every one of the mitzvot, even when we do understand, there are many that we understand. We understand why we eat kosher. Aside from the health benefits and the spirituality benefits, we understand it. The true reason of why we do every mitzvah, all 613 that we can and some that we can't do, is because God said so. That's the real reason. Whether you know the benefit or not is irrelevant. Hopefully you know some benefits, but because it gives you more ambition to do it. But the key here is that you don't need to understand it. And that's what Moshe was telling Koach, is that it doesn't matter if you understand why there's a mezuzah on the wall or not. Hashem said to put a mezuzah, we put a mezuzah. Even if the whole house is full of Sifre Torah. So now Moshe Rabbeinu goes to the Tan and Aviram. He's trying to plead with them. Don't take it too far. Don't take it too far. You know, he's trying to, because he sees that the situation with Koach is not getting better. Koach is completely unbearable, can't fix anything, he doesn't, he doesn't want to talk about anything, he's convinced to go his way. So Moses 
confronts Datan and Aviram. And Datan and Aviram say something horrible. They say, isn't it enough that you brought us from the land, from the land, flowing with milk and honey to bring us to this wilderness? It's the thing from the land, meaning Egypt, they're calling Egypt where we were slaves and tortured on a daily basis that Hashem had to perform miracles to get us out of that hellhole. They're calling that land the land of milk and honey. And you brought us to this wilderness, to the desert. And even the promise that you made to take us to the land of milk and honey, you told us last week's parasha, we're not going to go there. A whole generation is going to die before we get there. So your empty promises. We had a good, good situation in Egypt. We're good. This is a huge bizayon. This is a huge disrespect, not only to Moshe Rabbeinu, but to God himself. Because God performed all of those miracles to get you out of that hellhole called Egypt. And you're calling that place the same description that Hashem uses to describe Eretz Yisrael. Not to slap in the face, basically. It shows you that the wicked sometimes get to become so they buy into their nonsense, their lies so much that they start believing themselves. They start creating things and they start making up false truths. They start telling people that, oh yeah, we used to have a very good situation because you know we were in Egypt, now we're in a bad situation. And they try convincing other people to do it. And they tell Moshe that even if you gouge the eyes of the, of the men, we're not going to go with you. Meaning even if you physically hurt us, we're still not going to join you. We're not going to give up. We're going to stay against you. This is how far they were. Who said that? Uh, this is... Uh, um, Datan and Aviram. They said that. They said that. Okay. Fine. Not, they're inconsolable. They're, they're unbearable, these people. Fine. But then there's a very, very surprising situation. After Moshe Rabbeinu tells Korach and Datan and Aviram, and there are 250 followers, 250 major rabbis with them on their team. Not just uh, Rashaim. It's 250 sages, leaders, people that are well known are with them. After this, he said, okay, we're going to do an offering. We're going to do a, a, a korban for Hashem with the ketoret, the incense. You bring an incense, each one of you bring an incense, 250 incenses. And our Lord's going to bring an incense. We're going to bring it to God. And we see who he takes. If he takes our Lord's incense and not yours, then you know that everything that we did is what Hashem wants. Hashem gave us the position we have. Hashem gave us everything that we have. If he takes yours, then you know that it's not Hashem that gave us the position, then you're right. Fine. But after the conversation he had with the Tan Aviram, it says, Moshe Meod, Adonai, Al Tefin El Minchatam, Lochamo Echad Mehem, Nasati Velo Et Echad Mehem. says, This distressed Moses greatly, and he said to Hashem, Do not turn to their gift offering. I have not taken even a single donkey of theirs, nor have I wronged even one of them. So now, okay, so we have this camp, he knows the entire Torah by heart, it's very uh, amazing. So now, here's the thing, here's, here's, pay attention to this. All of us here know just even the first, we know the story. You don't need to be a genius to realize these people are going against the Shem and Moshe, right? You don't need to think too much about how they're Rashaim and going against the Torah, right? Moshe says... We're going to have a contest tomorrow. 
We're going to bring a korban to Hashem, the incense offering to Hashem, the ketoret, and you're going to bring the ketoret. But then he says over here that he was very upset, and he goes to Hashem and he says to him, don't accept. He's asking Hashem, don't accept their ketoret. Again, we're going back to logic now. What do you mean? Don't, he's asking Hashem, don't accept it. What Hashem needs is instructions, don't to accept it. Why is he even worried that Hashem may accept it? You're a tzaddik. You're doing everything. Hashem, you know that Hashem picked you. You talk to Hashem every day. Why do you have to convince Hashem that you didn't do anything wrong, that you didn't even take a donkey? Meaning, what he's referring about the donkey is that he didn't even get paid for any of his services, for everything that he does. He does he's doing everything purely for Hashem. Even the donkey that he used to go to Egypt to free Am Yisrael from Egypt, he didn't ask for, re, uh, for a uh, compensation for it, a reimbursement. He's doing everything for free. He's telling this to Hashem out of open. He's not telling this to people. He's telling this to Hashem. He's like, Hashem, to, please don't accept their koban. Don't accept them. Why are you telling Hashem? You know you're doing the right thing. Did he ask the Hashem before he said, let's do the compass? Uh, well, I mean, he, let me see, actually, he did, no, this is after he mentioned the, 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 uh, the thing. But, I mean, Hashem has spoken to him before, so, there's a, uh, it's a good question. No, it doesn't, doesn't, from here, it doesn't seem like he asked him before he did it. In the right I direction. Think, I, I don't think he needs to ask permission for that. Even if he didn't ask. Yeah, he didn't ask. Even if he didn't ask that. Even if he didn't ask that. Okay, no. okay, but the thing is, though, the point is that even if he didn't ask, he's saying over here, I'm going to have my koban. You're going to have your koban. If Hashem accepts mine, then I, I get it. If Hashem doesn't accept, accept yeah, yours, he, you wait. He might accept But the point is, he's telling him, no. he's telling Hashem, don't accept theirs. What are you worried about? He's accepting theirs, meaning because if, they, if, if, he, if Hashem accepts theirs, that means they win. So why is he worried that Hashem will even accept theirs? They're all Hashem. They're all evil. They're all doing and making a major sin. What do you think, Tomo? It's a good question because I was thinking something else. I was thinking that he that he put that out there because of his humility, showing that okay, I might he maybe he believed in himself. Maybe I'm not righteous. Maybe I'm not. Oh, it's so let God decide. But then he's asking God, and don't accept theirs. So now that's a question. That's a big. Uh, You're in the right direction. Yeah. He's well, davening. Like, he's like, davening. Like almost he doesn't he's believe davening. in Hashem. He's at davening to Hashem. He's ah, praying. okay, okay. All, all, okay. We add up all of your answers. We got the answer. Moshe knew the power of prayer. He knew the power of prayer can change Hashem's decrees. And he knew he was righteous. He knew he was doing the right thing. But he also knew that these, generally, they were tzaddikim, these people. Well, like Ruach HaKodesh, these are righteous people. And they're all going to spend all night praying to Hashem. And he's hoping that Hashem doesn't accept their prayers. Because he knows that a true prayer, when someone is crying, all the gates of tshuva can be closed except the gate of tears. So if you ever have a situation where you truly need Hashem to help you, you truly need Siyat Vishmaya, start crying. Truly crying. Connect to Hashem through tears. Because that is a gate that's always opened. And Moses was afraid of, afraid of that gate. He was afraid that with the going to pray in such a deep level and connect to Hashem that Hashem would actually let their prayers go through. This, like Tomer said, showed his humility. Like Warren said, showed prayer. Like Nirel said, you had to really ask God, technically, is this the right step or not? And he's unsure. The next day, they do this, the whole scene gets together. Everyone gets their fire pans. They get together in front of the tent of meeting. 
וידבר אדוני אל משה ואל אהרון לאמור, ייבדלו מתוך העדה הזאת ואכלה אותם כרגע. השם ספוק to Moses and Aaron saying, separate yourselves from amid this assembly and I shall destroy them in an instant. So obviously Hashem picked Moshe's side. The surprising part is the next verse. ויפלו על פניהם ויאמרו אל אלוהי הרוחות לכל בשר האיש אחד יחטא ועל כל העדה תקצוף. So after Hashem says to Moshe and Aaron, separate yourselves from these people and I'll destroy all of them. Moshe and Aaron fall on their faces and plead with God and saying, O oh God, God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with the entire, entire assembly? They're still trying to help these people. They're like, okay, he sinned. Koach sinned. We know his sin is really bad. But maybe we can still help some of these other people. Maybe they don't really mean it. Why, are you going to kill all of them because one man sinned? This shows you what it takes to be Gdolado. This shows you what it means when you truly are Gdolado, when you truly are one of these leaders, sage, like this, you have to love the people even when they're going against you. Such a love, like a father to a son. Just like, you know, a son can do everything going against his father, but it's, when it's true love, when it's father and son love, it's still going to hurt the father to, you know, do anything bad to his kid. Even if technically it's helping him. Here, this is not really his children, but he loved them to that extent and even more so. That even when they're going against him and publicly humiliating him, he's still trying to convince God to not kill all of them. How many? 250? This is 250 of the followers and, uh, and Koach and his family. So instead of Backing down, it says that Vedatan ve'aviram yitzu nitzavim petach ha'alehem Unshem uvneim v'tapam It says Datan and Aviram went out erect with a lot of gava, a lot of uh, confidence The entrance of their tents, they brought their wives, their children, their infants So Moses is telling him, okay, Hashem just, you know Separate yourselves from Korach. Separate yourselves from Datan and Aviram. Separate yourselves because whoever doesn't separate himself from them is going to die. Now listen. As soon as Moses finished these words, it says, when he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open. The, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and their household and all the people who were at Korach and their entire wealth. They and all that was theirs descended alive to the uh, Sheol, is that, is actually Sheola is what it's called here in English, it's translated as pit. The earth covered them over and they were lost from among the congregation. All Israel was around them, fled at their sound, for they said, lest the earth swallow us. Now the ground swallowed them. Hashem made this giant miracle where he swallowed, the, the ground opened up and just swallowed those specific people. didn't swallow everyone. It wasn't like an earthquake where everyone can say, ah, it's a natural event. It only swallowed them. And he made a, Hashem made a specific event like this to make sure that everyone knows that it's him doing it and not something called nature that people give an excuse all the time. The second thing is, is that it says, it's very interesting, is that it says it swallowed all of their wealth. Why did, they, why did Hashem take all of their money too with them? Because he didn't want to give them the schut where if he swallowed them, but their money was left over, was going to give it to other righteous people that do mitzvot. And then you can say that hey, because of their money, other people did mitzvot. He didn't want to give them the schut. When they were going against Hashem and Moshe like that, he didn't want to give them any schut at all. And then it says, they descended alive to the pit. But in, in, in Hebrew, it's different. 
הם וכל אשר להם חיים שאולה. שאולה comes from שאול. שאול is another word for hell. In Tehillim you read it also. A lot of other places in, in the Torah. So sometimes I think uh, Tomer does, but a few of you in the past you guys have asked me about you know hell, earth. I don't try, we don't talk about it that much because it's a little scary. But this is very interesting about uh, I, I read in, it's in Masechet Taanit. They compare the Gemara compares the sizes of various places, the size of different things in the world. Tanu Rabbanan. The Rabbi is talking about it. Eretz Mitzvah, oh, I'll say, just say it in English. The land of Egypt is 400 parsa by 400 parsa. Parsa is about two and a half uh, miles, 2.3 to 2.9 miles. So are saying the land of Egypt is 400, is, uh, 400 parsa by 400 parsa. So uh, I did the measurement. It's somewhere close to the calculation, somewhere close to about 370,000 uh, square miles, which if you look on Google, it's about right. Which is amazing how the sages from 2,000 years ago know exactly the size of Egypt. Okay. And Egypt is 160th the size of Kush. Meaning that Kush is 60 times bigger. And the world is 60 times bigger than Kush. And Eden, which is part of the first part of Gan Eden, is 60 times bigger than the world. The other part of Eden, the bigger part of Eden, is 60 times bigger than that Eden. There's two parts of Gan Eden. Just like you have, let's say, for example, the whole house, you have, let's say, the entrance, and you have the rest of the house. And the Gehenom is 60 times bigger than Eden. And some say that Gehenom does not have a measure, does not have a size. Why am I telling you this? Some people, unfortunately... <coughs> We talk about this all the time. They learn the wrong Torah. They learn a Torah that only has nice things. Oh, connect to God spiritually and you love Him and everything is great and you get reward and you be rich and you have a wife and, and everything is great. And uh, if you pray at least you know once a year on Yom Kippur, God loves you. And if you grow these strange payas, He'll save you from bad things and all these you know weird things that people do. The Torah is a lot of good things. There's also a lot of punishment too. There's a reward and punishment. Someone that truly only talks about reward is only talking about half the Torah. So sometimes you hear people say, no, every Jew has a share to the world to come. That's not true. A Jew, a righteous Jew, has a share to the world to come. The rest of that verse is, and these are the following Jews that do not have a share to the world to come. And it gives you all the sins that people do that those people do not have share in the world to come. Mechalel Shabbat, Zerlev Atalah, and so on and so forth. A list of people that do not have a share in the world to come. So when you tell that to someone who doesn't know Torah, they say, wait a minute, but this is most of the world. So what are you telling me? That Hashem is going to kill the whole world? What, he's going to punish everyone? The simple answer is yes, if they don't do tshuva. Simple as it gets. That's, that's, that's the only honest answer. If they do not choose tshuva, based on his Torah, yes. And when you know the size of Gehenom, now to this Gemara, Masechet Ta'anit, uh, the ninth uh, daf, you know it's true, because you see, the size of it throughout history, the majority of people have not been righteous. I mean, that's just, you see, it's not just today, throughout all of history. Whether it's the generation of Noah, or the... Uh, uh, Migdal Bavel, the, the Tower of Babel, or the Egyptians, or the idol worshippers during uh, Abraham's generation, or anything, throughout all of life. 
not just the Nazis and the uh, you know and the uh, Arabs or anything. It's throughout all of history, the majority of people have not been righteous. This is a perfect fit. Logically, you would see. Okay, yes, Hashem. Not only does Gano need to be really big, but Hashem's not kidding. Is the point? Someone does not that does not live a life in accordance to what Hashem said they should do should not be living a lie and lying to themselves and saying, "Listen, I'm not only not going to do what Hashem said, but I have the same Gan Eden as uh, as Moshe Rabbeinu." I'll be fine, don't worry about it, I'll figure it out once I get there. That's nonsense. And again, this is not necessarily meant to scare anyone, uh, it's, but it's, it's, it's meant to make sure that we're all realistic with our expectations. You cannot fool yourselves to believe that uh, we can do whatever we want in this world and uh, there's no problem. The next thing is that it says, and I mentioned it actually, I don't know whether the shiur was on or not yet, but also about Koach, is that uh, about how it says that they will, uh, they're still to this day still screaming that uh, God is truth, His Torah is truth, and Moshe is uh, His truth also. Uh, it says here in the verse, V'chol Yishayel Hashel Sivivotehim Nasu lekolam. So all of Israel heard their voice. They all, it says specifically they were buried alive, and everyone heard their voice, meaning after they were buried, they're still screaming. So this is really a, uh, an extraordinary situation because, again, this person came from being a righteous person. And all of these 250 people were also very, very righteous people. So now you would think that everyone got the hint. You would think that the rest of Am Yisrael got the hint. Okay, Koach did wrong. Hashem killed him. The 250 followers he had did wrong. Hashem killed them too. Hashem swallowed Koach and his family. And the 250 he burned them. There was a fire that came and burned all of them. Okay, so you think that the rest of the nation got the gist. A flame came from Hashem, forth from Hashem and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. Okay, so it says it's a, uh, it says it in Mephorash, it's in, you know, it's not uh, Amidash, it says it, well, they're all burnt. Okay, so it's no question of whether maybe let it go or let it slide because they were nice people. But then, The entire assembly of the children of Israel complained on the morrow against Moses and Aaron the next day, saying, You have killed the people of God. So instead of telling Moshe and Aaron, Okay, good, you're the winners, we're on your side. Chazaku Baruch. Hashem really picked you. It's like, no, you killed them. Meaning that uh, the contest that you had, you knew that if they were wrong, they were going to get killed. Because just like the, uh, uh, Aaron's kids, when they gave the, they did, made a mistake with the Ketoret, Hashem killed them. So you used the same weapon. You used the Ketoret because you knew that if they're wrong, then Hashem's going to kill them. Why did you have to use such extreme measures? Why couldn't you just do a different contest without death? Why did it have to be death? So they're going against Moshe again. And they're not only going against Moshe, they're calling the people that Hashem, that Hashem killed, the people of God. Like they were the righteous people, not you. Mamash absurd. Hashem spoke to Moses saying, Remove yourselves from among this assembly and I shall destroy them in an instant. Again. Again. <laughs> again, Hashem has had it enough. Again, Hashem wants to destroy the nation again. <laughs> Was it 24,000? Dot. And a plague has begun. 
Behold, the plague has begun among the people. And later on it says 14,700 people died. Hashem started a plague. And instantly 14,700 people died. A bunch of other people got sick. So now the Koach and his buddies, Koach died. His family died. With the exception of his kids, by the way. His kids didn't die. That's Chuba. why you see in Tehilim. Well, actually, you know what? How long, how long after the Meraglim it's happened? We know. Right, right away. Right, right after. away. Yeah, yeah, right after. So it's like the people left, it's like uh, 20 years old and... Uh, no, no, no. 14,000, not 14. Uh, there's millions of people. No, but... Okay, okay. It didn't die straight away. The 20 the people, and above died over the next 39 years. 20 and above died over the next 39 years. Yeah, the, the only people that died right away from the, from the spies were the 10 out of the 10, uh, 12 spies. Okay. 10 out of the 12 spies, yeah. or the two spies that didn't die was Yeshua ben Nun and Kalu. They didn't die. The other 10 died instantly from a plague. The rest of the people above 20 years old, they died over the next 39 years in the desert. They never made it to Israel. The people below 20 years old and the women, some of them died naturally, some of them didn't die, but over, you know, over the years, but they didn't get punished. Only people that got punished to never see Israel were the people above 20 years old, the men above 20 years old, um, and they <coughs> died at some point over the next 39 years. But here, Koach kids. and his uh, family, no, what's it, his wife died instantly. His kids, which I believe were three kids, three boys, they, uh, they did tshuva in the last minute, and they didn't die. And that's why, actually, if you read, uh, you know, tefillah of Shachrit, Shachrit starts with Bnei Koach. You read a tehillim, it uh, starts talking about Bnei Koach. Um, and uh, why is in, in several tehillim that mention Bnei Koach, the sons of Koach? Why does it mention the sons of Koach so many times? Because the sons of Koach made... One of the most difficult chuvas in history. They did a chuva before all of this happened. When 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 uh, Moses was warning everyone, they were the ones that listened. And they uh, they did chuva, and the uh, the father said, the Korach said to them, "Well, if you uh, if you go against me, you're out of the will." Korach was the richest man of Israel. I think they said, the Midrash said that he had, uh, was it five or three or five camels just to carry the keys to all of his safes. <laughs> That's how rich he was. Play the keys. Just to carry the keys to all <laughs> the safes. Meaning that like someone like Bill Gates could be an employee for him. That's why in Hebrew there's still, uh, still an expression, Ashik uh, Mokoach. <laughs> Rich like Koach. Koach was very, very rich. He actually, his, his, uh, his wealth he found when Yosef at Sadiq was the viceroy of Egypt. He made <coughs> Egypt very, very wealthy because all of the people of Egypt and all over the world came to him for food. And he was the only one that stored food in it, uh, in, in, during the famine. So throughout the years, during the famine, people gave them all of, it, all of their money. Because they want food. So Egypt, that's how Egypt became a powerhouse. But then what happened is that he ended up having so Egypt ended up having so much money that he had to hide the money in three different places. Three different locations to hide all of this money that Egypt had. Korah found one of them. Korah had, had one of the uh, one of the treasures. He was very, very wealthy. So the other two didn't find it? No, one of them also the rest of Am Yisrael found too. And the other? Uh, the third one I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> so now, Koach was very, very wealthy. And uh, his sons had to choose. They didn't know their father was going to die. Again, remember, they don't know that their father's going to die. They don't know that their father's wrong, even. They have to decide, okay, I'm either going to put my father, who's rich, who's righteous, that's Ruach HaKodesh, 
He's got everything going for him. Okay, he's got to fight with this Moshe Rabbeinu guy, but it's my father. Usually, somebody says, even if uh, I don't agree with, the, with my father, I still pick my father's side. Right? They went against their father. Why? Because that's what Hashem said. Hashem, they know that whatever Moshe said is what Hashem said. They went with Moshe. And that saved them, and that's why with Tehilim, there's several Tehilim that it mentions the sons of Korach. Because they did Tshuva. So now, you have 250 people died, you know, and then Am Yisrael starts complaining to Moshe Rabbeinu. The next day. And, Hashem, and, and Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron, when Hashem says, remove yourself from them so I can destroy all of them, and if, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron fall on their faces again and start praying to Hashem, Hashem doesn't listen, doesn't stop anything, he starts putting a plague. 14, which instantly kills 14,700 people, and a bunch of other people get sick, too. Other people are on the way to getting sick. There's a very, very interesting uh, um, part now. So how do they stop this sickness? When Moshe Rabbeinu went to Al Sinai, all of the angels came to him. When he got the Torah, all of the angels came to him and gave him a gift. Every one of the angels came and gave him a gift. One of those angels, his name is Satan, the devil, the Yetzara. And he came and gave him a gift also. What was his gift? He told him the way to stop a plague is by doing a um, a ktoret, the korban ktoret, the incense offering. If you do an incense offering, it immediately stops a plague. So he gave him a secret, a trade secret. And Moshe Rabbeinu used this secret right here. The plague started, and he tells Aaron to go and light the, uh, the incense offering. Aaron goes into the middle of the plague, in between all of the people. So technically he could die right now. He's going next to all the people, you know, that have it, you know, some that are already dead, some that are sick, and some that are, it's coming to them. And he goes in the middle and he lights an incense offering, and it says, And it, sti- it stops the, uh, the, in- the uh, plague instantly. So the present from the uh, Yetzirah, Pays off. It's very interesting how they, you know, to know the details of behind the story of how they knew how to do, what to do. Um, and I th- and now we go into probably one of the most important parts. All of this mess started not only because of a bad woman. Because of a man that wanted something that didn't, he wasn't entitled to. He wanted a position of power, of kedusha, of significance. He wanted something that he didn't deserve and he wasn't entitled to. Pride. Many people in the world today have problems with pride. The root of most problems in the world are because of pride, because of kavod. Whether it's lashon hara, you have lashon hara because you think you're better than the other guy. What does it mean you think you're better? You have pride. Or anything else, most fights, arguments, competitions. Start with pride. Took someone that was a righteous person with Ruach HaKodesh to Rasha Merusha. It's still suffering to this day. And it's debatable whether he has a share of the world to come. Most say he doesn't. Some say the possibility because his story has been said so many times and helped people do tshuva is a possibility that it may have lifted his soul to possibly have a share to the world to come. But it's debatable, not 100%. He's that Korach. Korach. Okay. Am Yisrael doesn't listen. A bunch of them die. A lot more die as an after effect than during the actual scene. We don't learn. It's not very- Then Moshe, Hashem tells Moshe, listen, they still have questions. Hashem killed all those people. He really wanted to kill everyone that even thought bad, 
even had to think, they didn't say anything bad about Moshe. They didn't say anything bad about Hashem. They were just thinking it. Hashem wanted to kill them too. And that's what Moshe was pleading for. Don't kill them. It's the sin of one, one person, you know, sin of one person. You kill everyone. So Moshe's prayers get answered to some extent. But then Hashem says to him, okay, there's still people that don't believe. So take a stick, take one of the um, sticks from each tribe, each of the 12 tribes. And let Aaron be the leader from each one of the leaders of the tribes. And let Aaron be the representative of the tribe of Levi. And put his stick in the middle of everyone. So they don't think that there's something happened because it's in the corner or it's something. Let Make sure that he's next to everyone with everyone. So there's no questions. Put all of these... Before the uh, tent, in the tent of meeting, before the testimony, in the oil moed, and before you do that, inscribe each one of the tribes, the names of each one of the tribes on each one of the sticks. So the Levi stick has Levi on it, the Judah stick has Judah on it. So everyone knows who's which stick belongs to. So there's no confusion of. So he does that, he gets a stick from everyone, and the next morning, staff, staff is a better word than stick. Staff. So the next morning, Moshe comes to the tent of testimony, and he sees that the uh, staff of Aaron has a tree that grew on it, an almond tree, blossomed from it. Something beautiful, something miraculous, something that could take you know months and months to grow. Mamash, miracle. So he says, this should be a sign for them to see that not only did I choose, uh, you know, you, but I chose Aaron. I didn't just choose Moshe as the leader, but I chose Aaron to be the Kohen Gadol. This is obviously, he's, you know, I didn't do it to the other sticks, just to the other staffs, so they did just to his. Overnight miracle. Hashem doesn't just do miracles for no reason, just for... Staff. Staff, I'm, I'm, I'm a tishero. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> אז הוא מראה שהוא בחר לא רק את משה, הוא בחר את אהרון, להיות הכהן גדול. So now he picked it, shows it to them, great. He says, Hashem says to Moses, bring back the staff of Aaron before the testimony as a safekeeping. Meaning, put this staff aside. Chazal explains to us that he put it aside with the man. You remember a few, uh, like a, a month, Almost two months ago, a month and a half ago, Moses told uh, uh, told us that uh, to put the uh, some of the man in a in a, uh, in a jar, so everyone can remember for all of times that we actually had this man. No one says there was some uh, dream or illusion. There was no such thing as food from Shemaim. We had it, so he put it in a jar. He put this uh, staff in a jar, and they were actually in the Bet Hamikdash. They were in the Bet Hamikdash. Uh, and they stayed with us for many, many, many years until uh, um, uh, the king uh, Yossi, uh, Yoshia, uh, Hosea, Hosea uh, hit him before the destruction of the first Bet Migdash. Okay. So now, the children of Israel said to Moses, saying, Behold, we perish, we are lost, we are all lost. Everyone who approaches closer to the tabernacle of Hashem will die. Will we ever stop perishing?
Ayim tamnu l'gvoa. So he's saying to Moshe, it's like we're all dying, you know, with this plague. Koas people died. They got buried. Then 14,700 people died. Are we ever going to stop dying? We just keep dying. Last uh, week's parasha, people died. We're just dying all the time. Is this, is this ever going to stop? In Gemara Masechet Ta'anit, same Gemara we talked about before, something very, very interesting. Is a uh, uses a uh, verse in, in Proverbs, Proverbs uh, Mishle, Proverbs nineteen three. It says, Adam So it says, Amen. a person does something wrong, his foolishness, meaning his sins. He does sins. After he does sins, it puts him in a different direction. Gets punished. So he does wrong things against Hashem. He gets punished because of what he did. And what does he do? He complains to Hashem. He blames Hashem for his sins, for his punishment. This is us. We do something wrong. We do something against Hashem. Hashem punishes us. And we say to Hashem, oh, how come you're doing this to me? Like as if we're innocent. This is what Am Yisrael over here is doing. He's like, well, we got to stop dying. It's all your fault. What do you mean when are you going to stop dying? You did it. And that's the absurdity of human nature. And we tend to do it subconsciously. It's not that we're intentionally doing it. We do it... We're saying we do something wrong. We don't pay too much attention to what we did wrong. Oh, okay, so I drove once. What's the big deal on Shabbat? It's not a big deal. Oh, okay, so I ate Subway sandwich. It was the tuna. It wasn't the meat. Oh, I, uh, you know, I don't know. I uh, went with uh, one girl. Okay, no big deal. You know, everybody makes excuses. Everything that they do that's not that's against the it's not a big deal. But the fact that I lost, uh, I don't know, $100,000 of the stock market, that's a big deal. Why are you doing this to me, Hashem? Why are you doing this to me? Going to a casino. <clears throat> casino anywhere. What we do is not a big deal. What Hashem does is always a big deal. We're always, you know, too much. He's too harsh on us. And that's what the absurdity of this situation is. That one of the examples they use is the brothers in the, in the, in the Gemara. Is they use the brothers of Yosef HaTzadik. The brothers of Yosef and Sadiq sold him. Obviously, they were wrong. After they went to Egypt, when there was famine, their father Yaakov sent them, even though they all had food, they had food, he still sent them to, uh, to Egypt to go buy food so the neighbors don't think, don't become jealous that they have food. Don't think that they are not suffering. So he sent them there. Obviously, this is all divine providence. Hashem made everything work that way. And they go and they go buy the food from Yosef at Sadiq. They don't know he's, it's their brother. So they go buy the food from him. And obviously, the story goes where initially he traps them, where he leaves, uh, he doesn't tell them that he's him. And he, uh, to get them to come back, he puts some of the money that they use to pay him to buy the food. And back into the one of their bags. So, in his mala, when he sends his soldiers to catch them, he said, oh, you stole money from the king? He's like, no, we didn't steal anything. And he's like, all right, let me look at your bags. They look through the bags, and they say, oh, here's the money. So what do they say? Vayichredu ish el achiv so they're each, they all got really afraid, and they're saying to each other, what is this that God has done to us? What is this that God has done to us? It's his fault. Now they, they're using this as an example, as a hint, because this whole Gemara is about how... Um, uh, Resh Lakish is explaining, uh, the, I'm sorry, uh, Rabbi Yochanan is explaining to the son of Resh Lakish uh, that everything, every lesson that we have has a hint of it in, 
uh, in the Torah, but the point is that this is part of human nature. It's part of human nature to not take responsibility for our actions. Always blame God, like he's always over-punishing and overdoing it, and what we did is not a big deal. And the critical lesson is that we have to figure, we have to be our own worst critics, our own biggest critics. Someone that's trying to get closer to Hashem, someone that's trying to truly love Hashem, has to be a judge of himself. Has to be someone that is evaluating his own actions based on what Hashem's book says. Hashem says this, oh, I didn't do this today. You don't have to necessarily beat yourself up over it, but if you don't feel bad about sinning, there's something wrong. <clears throat> if, if you're driving on Shabbat to the Beknes and you think it's not a problem, I don't, th I don't think you believe in God. You believe in a different God, maybe, not the God that's in the Torah. Because God in the Torah doesn't allow driving on Shabbat. If you're doing a lot of different things, and we're not going to go over every single sin in the Torah, but the point is, if you're doing things that are, in essence, against what Hashem has told us to do, and you have some remorse, you have some parts of you that you feel bad about, then it shows you have a connection, and hopefully, by being a judge of your own actions, you become better at it, and little by little, the fact that you have pain from it shows that you have a connection with Hashem. Little by little, you stop. Little by little, you, tr you, you try to beat the Yetzirah and, and, and get closer to Hashem that way. But if you're not a judge of your own, of your own actions, then you'll never do tshuva. Then you'll never be close to Hashem. Then everything we talked about is just a waste because we'll, we'll end up with Koach. You understand? So again, this is... Being a judge of your own, being cr critical of yourself is critical for your development. It's the same thing with anything in life. If you want to be successful in business, being ambitious is not enough. We did a lot of business in, the, in this world, and I can tell you one thing. I was never the happiest employee. Made millions and millions of dollars at times, and always shooting for the moon. But when people looked at me, every day was the same thing. Every day was, I'm focused on winning. The fact that I already won was irrelevant. It was irrelevant. The first time I made a, 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 had my biggest month, and uh, at the time at least, and I made over $100,000, $117,000 in a month, and, a, and it was a Friday, and a friend of mine is like, okay, so aren't you going to go celebrate? And I was like, what do you mean, go celebrate? Why, why am I going to celebrate? We just made more money than the rest of us did this year, this month. Why don't you go celebrate? He goes, oh, well, Monday starts a new month. What am I celebrating exactly? Okay, finished. I did it. Monday's a new month. There was another time when it was $600,000 in a month. Someone said, oh, well, we're going to go party tonight? I'm like, why? What are we partying? So, didn't you make a lot of money? Like, yeah, and? Well, why don't you go party? I'm like, well, I expected to make a lot of money because I work hard and that's the point. I'm not coming here to, for charity. And that was my mentality. My goal in life is to have the same mentality with God. And every day to have higher expectations of myself. And I, and I encourage every one of you guys to do the same thing. I'm not righteous, I'm not a tzaddik, I'm not anything. But I'm telling you that that mentality works. It worked in business, it works in religion, it works in everything. You, have, you cannot spend too much time patting yourself on the back and calling yourself Mr. Righteous and everything is great and celebrating your past success. Your past success is exactly what it is. It's past. It's irrelevant. Unless you can use it to help people, like by telling you guys a story to motivate you, that's the only use it has. The fact that I made, didn't make, all of that stuff is useless. It's a waste of time. You know, if it wasn't useful for this, uh, for this uh, lecture, I would never mention it. The point of the story is the lessons we can learn from it. Your past is only good if it can help people 
as far as lessons. The fact that you are a NASA astronaut or a big time stockbroker or anything is useless. What's useful is what you can use to develop your character. And in this world, we finally discovered that our point in the world is not to be rich. A point in this world is not to be beautiful. A point in this world is not to spend our time watching basketball on television. A point in this world is to do what Hashem wants. And what Hashem wants requires effort. And does not have much time to be wasted on us patting ourselves on the back. It's, it's, again, I'm not telling you to be miserable or to uh, be upset. But the goal is to be focused on the prize. When we do that, then we have a much, much liker, uh, likely a chance of success. When we don't do it, we can very easily fall into this trap of blaming the world for our flaws. Because if you don't succeed, you fail. There's nothing in the middle. There's no such thing as someone that's in the middle. Either they succeed at what they do or they fail. You know, there's no one that's like, oh, I'm just making it. It's no such thing. It's only it's a matter of time. You're in the middle because you haven't either succeeded or failed, but it's only a temporary thing. You're either about to make it or you're about to fail. So the fact that you haven't completed the mission is it doesn't mean that you, you've you've done either one of them. You either succeed or you fail. So if you succeed, then obviously you have more motivation to continue going. But when you fail, the only thing you have is pretty much feeling sorry for yourself. Oh, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this. Or you can use that same experience to motivate yourself to you know, try again and get up again. And that's, that's pretty much the job of a Jew is to constantly get up, constantly try, constantly do things to, to, get, you know, to, to improve themselves. And that, getting up and re-getting up, <clears throat> that's success. There's no such thing as success in the Judaism of doing all of the mitzvot. There's no such thing as a perfect Jew. No one knows the whole Torah. No one does every single one of the mitzvot. No one lives a, a life without sin. That's not success. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about success. Success is the effort. But the only way you're going to have the effort is if you judge yourself, honestly. If you start off with nothing and now you're keeping Shabbat, then obviously you need, it's time to go to the next thing. You can't stay keeping Shabbat forever. And that's it. You have to now keep kosher. Then tefillin. Then so on. Then uh, tefillah. Then uh, learning Torah. And so on and so forth. You have to constantly progress. You can't just see, oh no, I'm a Shomer Shabbat, but because your own told me if I don't Shomer Shabbat, I go to hell and that's not good. So I'm just going to be Shomer Shabbat, but I'm still going to eat pork three times a week. You have to constantly progress. And when you do that, you'll be amazed at how you look back every year and you can't even recognize the past self. And that's, a, that's an honest and fair assessment of yourself because you see that you've progressed. But when you don't do it, you just stay status quo. In Judaism, unfortunately, there's no such thing as staying the same. It's either you rise to the top and come to your shiru on time. So Be'ezat Hashem, we continue to get closer to Hashem, and unless you guys have any questions, well, I, I had the, I let you guys go to sleep. Yeah, just the one similarity. It's, it's, it's interesting because last week after the after the Miraglim, okay. the incident, the Jews went and they climbed up the mountain. They were like, Hashem said, don't go up that mountain. They still went. And they still went. And I said to my kids, he says, when you make a mistake, sometimes you try and overcompensate. Okay. And you try, Hashem said, don't do it, you're going to get killed. So that's another, that's an insight in when you do something wrong, like to step back and think about it and to, to not overcompensate your avera, to try and be a hero. And, yeah, and be, a, be honest with yourself. Be an honest yeah. uh, judge of yourself. And yeah. Admit to a mistake. It's okay. If exactly. you don't know something, you don't know something. You make a mistake, you make a mistake. Don't go, you fall, you fall. Don't, don't get up. Don't have pride. Don't, don't come back and try to be a hero. Yeah. You know, like, 100%. just take your sin and do your tshuva. And then this week, it was different because they, they were complaining. They were just, they were just negative. They were... Yeah. So I'm trying when to... When are we ever going to stop dying? 
how, how do you how do you how do you join those two comparisons? Well, like I, between I, I, last I think week's running up the mountain and this week yeah. complaining. They, I'm trying to join the two. It's it's the same exact. Yeah. It's the same verse applies to both as far as blaming God for our flaws because. Mm-hmm. But why are right, we running? Right. Because when they're running up, they're pretty much once they found out that they were wrong about the land of Israel. And they're not going to be rewarded the land in their generation. Yeah. They didn't want to accept it. They said, no, 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 now we want it, now we want it. So they ran up the mountain because they're like, no, it's, what's going on? This is a, uh, we're entitled to this. It's not fair. And but you're run. punishing us. Uh, it's not fair. Okay. We, then, we should go to the land because you already promised us it's not fair. They, they went and they got punished again. They Another were punishment. trying to overcompensate. They were trying to say, why were they running up that mountain? What were they were trying, to... trying to cross the border. The border? Yeah, they were trying to go into Israel. Oh, they were trying to get into Israel. Yeah, trying to okay. go into, it was called Canaan at the time. Okay. They were trying to go into Canaan. Okay. And uh, because, because, Hashem, because that's where they were when they sent the spies, they were pretty much at the border. Okay. So they sent them over there. There was technically, if the spies didn't fail, we were supposed to go into Eretz Israel at that moment. The spies failed. We got punished. Hashem said, you're not going to go into the land. But they said, no, 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 we don't, no, no, it's not our fault. It's not our fault. We're going to go anyway. Because they couldn't accept that their own actions led to disaster. Same thing with, these, with this week's parasha. When, how, how all this how, happened? Like, why they don't go already inside? They just, it seems like they stay in the board like many times, you know, like... What do you mean? Long time. Like, all this time, they come to the board. Yeah, yeah also the Meraglim. So the why are they waiting for? No, the, why they don't no, go inside? The spies, the spies, they, they were at the border or close to the border because they wanted to see what's in it. They wanted to check, you know, before you don't just move a bunch yeah, of they people. Want to go. They wanted to see what's going on over there. After they failed, after the spies came back, the spies told them that there's giants, we're going to die if we go there. So Hashem said, okay, now you're not going to go there. And they said, no, 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 we want to go. So they started going. And yeah, but the, then they punished and everything. Then, then the people of Canaan started killing them. So they retreated. And then Hashem told Moshe, turn everyone around and go back towards Yamsuf. Go back, turn around the land, turn around the, the people and start walking towards Yamsuf, towards the Sea of Reeds. Mm-hmm. So they walked away from the border. So at this time... Gotcha. At the time of this week's parasha, the, they're no it longer... It in the, in the Torah? It's like they go to the Yamsu? No, I made it up. Yeah, no, it's no, like it's from the Gemara or something. I don't no, know. no, it says it over here. <laughs> eh, to the time. Uh, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's all good. Oh, hold on, hold on, give me the verse. Hold on, so somebody... Uh, no, it's okay. ויאמר אדוני משה לאמו לא 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 uh, I'll, show, I'll show you the, uh, it's, it's a, um, a judgment. Okay, I'll find this, I'll find it, it'll take, take me a minute or two. But anyway, any other questions? So it's the same thing, it's the... And this is the same thing, they couldn't accept, they couldn't accept their own... You know, their foolishness... When they said uh, to Hashem, why we keep dying, how did it end after that? Did it just say, stun the end of the Pasha? No, 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 it wasn't there. It's was actually more to the Pasha. But, but I'm saying, like, like after that Pasha. incident, did, I, did it just go parav after that? Did it just go... Like, after they complained about that, why we keep dying? Yeah. And then what happened? Did it oh, we, we, we segue to something else. We started talking about our own... And then the, the gifts to the Kohanim. Okay. So there wasn't a, uh, like a, uh, yeah, a response uh, to, uh, to it. It was pretty much, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's their own actions. They, they didn't want to accept their, their own punishment. That was the, uh, their foolishness led to bad things. Foolishness led to punishment. So therefore, once they got the punishment, 
they didn't want to accept it. They ran off the mountain. This week's parasha, their foolishness of going against Moshe and Hashem, let the punishment, Korach's people died, they didn't accept it, so they started complaining about Moshe anyway, another 14,700 people died. You know, so it's in essence the same thing. It's actually just a, uh, the, the second punishment yes. is bigger than the first in both parashot. The Meragrim, 10 people died instantly. The rest of them died over the next 39 years. This week's parasha, 250 or so people died instantly. Plus Korach. But the second punishment was 14,700. In last week's parasha, many more people died in the, when they went up the mountain to a war. So, it's... Hashem gives us a small punishment initially, even though we did a big sin, but when we still don't listen, the punishments just get bigger. It's the same thing with the Jew's life. When someone is not waking up, not doing tshuva, Hashem will give him a slap. He doesn't wake up, he gives him two slaps. He doesn't wake up, he gives him a punch. And it keeps getting worse and worse. Because again, if Hashem is not giving you slaps, you actually have a bigger problem. Because that means that you're one of the... Uh, I don't know if you guys or anything, but that, that person is one of those people that Hashem gave up on them. And uh, it's a Hashem uh, Elusha, where it's pretty much he's giving them all the rewards... In for the few world. mitzvahs that they did in this world because they have no, no, uh, nothing else after this so that's any good. Everything that's left is bad. So, Bezat Hashem, we continue judging ourselves favorably <laughs> and judging ourselves righteously and, and doing what Hashem wants. Yeah. 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 Yeah.